but that changed in January when the unexpected departure of World Bank President Dr. Jim Wykeham gave Trump the opportunity to remake the institution with his own pick. About a month after Kim announced his departure, Trump nominated Treasury Department official David Malpass to run the World Bank. In announcing the nomination in February, Trump said he hoped that Malpass would make sure that U.S. taxpayers' dollars are spent effectively and wisely and that financing is focused on the places and projects that truly need assistance. Our dream is a world free of poverty, reads the bank's motto, engraved in the airy atrium of its headquarters in downtown Washington. The World Bank seeks to achieve that mission by giving loans tendered on terms far more favorable than what the private marketplace has to offer making for a curious mix of philanthropy and high finance. But the institution has also suffered from ideological whiplash, not to mention a dose of scandal. In the 1970s, the bank was run by Robert McNamara, who as Defense Secretary to John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson helped lead the nation into the Vietnam War. He viewed the bank presidency as a way to redeem himself after Vietnam, wrote Patrick Allen Sharma a historian of McNamara's tenure at the World Bank, focusing explicitly on poverty reduction while expanding the bank's borrowing and lending portfolios, staff size and research program. But as the bank grew, so did concerns about institutional excess, underscored by the contrast between well-paid bank employees and the poor countries they were supposed to be serving. In 1983, a Democratic lawmaker called the World Bank a fat cat institution run for the benefit of the officers. Whether fully fair or not, the image stuck. Paul Wolfowitz, who as Deputy Defense Secretary pushed George W. Bush into war with Iraq, made news at the World Bank for another reason altogether after becoming its president in 2005. Even as he vowed to eliminate corruption in the bank's lending practices, Wolfowitz became ensnared in a scandal of his own, as it came to light that he had advocated for an improper pay raise for his partner Shahariza, an economist at the World Bank. Wolfowitz was forced to resign in 2007, after a contentious meeting with employees. These forces conspired to turn the World Bank into a vanishingly small institution, says Scott Morris, a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. President Obama's pick to lead the World Bank was supposed to change that. Obama nominated Kim in the spring of 2012 to be the bank's first non-white president, as well as the first to come from the field of public health. The son of Korean immigrants, Kim rose to be the director of the AIDS-HIV program at the World Health Organization and, after that, a global health expert at Harvard Medical School. In 2009, he was named the president of Dartmouth making him the first Asian American to lead an Ivy League institution. Kim only made things worse, according to several former high-ranking executives at the bank who frequently interacted with the new president early in his tenure. Upon coming to the bank, he had wanted the staff in the president's office dismissed, because he believed they were loyal to previous heads, remembers one executive from that time. The dismissals were initially blocked, but Kim did eventually manage to fire several senior staffers, all women, none for clear reasons. It was like an execution squad, says one person who witnessed the firings and the effect they had on staff morale. For his critics, Kim seemed to embody many of the worst stereotypes about the bank. According to several former senior executives, Kim chafed at limits on his spending. He wanted to fly on charter jets and to stay at hotels that were priced far above the bank's guidelines. I have friends who have travel expenses that are higher than my salary, he said, according to one person who worked with him closely at that time. We do not publicly discuss issues related to security, a World Bank spokesperson said. Some of Kim's requests struck career staffer as petty transgressions that were nevertheless indicative of his priorities. Kim asked for the World Bank to pay for tree removal at his Washington house, again citing security concerns, the request was denied. He used World Bank funds to purchase two tuxedos for the 2013 presidential inauguration. A World Bank official told News Pulse News that Kim, after being told that clothing purchases were not permitted by bank rules, reimbursed the bank for that expense.
Kim's spending came in contrast to the priorities he espoused, such as cutting some $400 million from the bank's annual budget that had risen to about $2 billion by 2012, while also reorganizing what even many of his critics saw a hidebound bureaucracy. The institution really needed change by the time Jim arrived, says one vice president from that time. At the same time, China continued to borrow from the World Bank at rates that seemed far too favorable for a full-scale superpower, according to Morris of the Center for Global Development. Clearly they are getting a subsidy by taking advantage of bank lending, Morris said of China, he said. There is a case for China to be borrowing, but they ought to pay more for it. But on January 8, 2019 less than two years into his new term, Kim abruptly announced an end to his six-and-a-half-year tenure with a brief address to a surprised staff, which had learned of his departure from news reports the previous day. Kim's new employer was Global Infrastructure Partners, or GIP, a private equity firm in New York with a portfolio of $40 billion. A spokesman for GIP declined to discuss Kim's hiring. JIP had recently bought an Indian firm that has done business with the World Bank, leading to questions about conflicts of interest. Asked at his departure address if he'd cleared his new employment with the World Bank board, Kim said that he had not. But he did say that, after a year-long cooling-off period, his new employer would become the best partner the World Bank group has ever had. Malpass, who became the bank's president earlier this month, is expected to take the bank in a direction more consistent with the Trump White House. Foremost in this category, for Malpass and Trump, is China, which has borrowed $60 billion from the World Bank for 416 projects. He has made clear that China will soon lose the favorable lending terms to which it became accustomed under his predecessors. At a recent event with reporters, he reiterated that China will be a much smaller borrower in the future while reiterating the fact that extreme poverty is concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. What else Malpass may do is not clear, but many World Bank insiders fear the worst. As one former senior official told News Pulse News for her assessment of Malpass, I am hard-pressed to think about any positives. Of course, the realities of governing which have often blunted the more radical intentions of the Trump administration, will likely play out with Malpass at the World Bank. It's hard for me to imagine that we will get the most hardline version of Malpass, says Morris of the Center for Global Development. Malpass has already made some conciliatory moves, such as announcing that no restructuring of the bank is forthcoming. In his remarks to the press upon assuming the presidency, Malpass mentioned women's empowerment and climate change.